Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we just pray for the Lord? I know we're here to talk about our identity, but can we just talk about the identity of our God for a moment? Can we just exalt the identity of our God? He's good. He's holy. He's righteous. Think about who he is to you. Think about the identity of your God to you. I know him as healer. I know him as deliverer. I know him as provider. I know him as light in the darkness. So just take a minute to think about who you know him as and who he's always been. All right, so we're going to be talking about our identity. So first, I give honor to the man of God of this house. Thank you for allowing me to come and to pour into your your sheep. I know it's not a job that you take lightly, so I honor you. I honor everybody here, um, all the members of this church. I honor my my, uh, my church members, my friends, my brothers and sisters from Hunger Church, thank you for being here. And to those who are watching online, we, we thank you for sacrificing your time as well. All right, so I want to be one of those corny preachers that says, if I had to give this message a title, I would title it this. So this title is going to be Stepping into the True You Tonight. All right, so we're going to read, we're just going to begin with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, and I'm reading from the NLT. So it says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness." All right, so let's just go into prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. We bless you, God. We honor you, Lord. We thank you for this moment. Father, we humble ourselves to hear from you, Lord. We have our agendas, but Father, we get out of the way. And Father, we come into agreement with what you desire to happen in this moment. Father, we open up our minds and our hearts. Lord, we thank you that your word will go forth with fire, with power, with clarity and anointing. Father, I thank you that you will break chains. Father, I thank you that strongholds be destroyed. Father, I thank you that shackles will be loosed off of your sons and daughters. Father, Father, we renounce and come out of agreement with everything that's not like you. And Father, we agree with what you have said about us. Father, we agree with what is said about us in heaven. So Father, we take authority over anything that has been sent to disrupt, to distract, to hinder your word going forth. Father, we thank you that we have a power and authority to trample on heads and serpents tonight. Father, I thank you that the enemy is under our foot. So Father, we declare your will shall be done tonight. Father, we thank you for the rising of sons and daughters in this hour, in this city, in this nation for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So typically when we talk about identity, at least it's my experience that when we come to church events and we talk about identity, we always hear messages about, you know, you're this great person. God is about to bring you into the next level. You're about to step into the next dimension. A door's about to open. You're this, you're that. But we can't get so caught up in who God has called us to be if we don't know what he's already said about us. And so in order to fully step into who God is calling you to be, you have to be grounded and secure in who God has already said that you are. We can't spend so much time about thinking about the future, thinking about ourselves, stepping into the next dimension when we can't even handle this dimension here. And so the way that our society, and especially Western society, is set up is that we're always, our minds have been conformed to think of that. If we can do great things, then we can be a great person. We get so caught up in doing great deeds and trying to work our way into an identity that God has already given to us freely. And so the Lord wants us to be secure in who you are before you go out and try to do what you've been called to do. We're living in a, in a, in a society, especially in Western cult, culture, where we make purpose this almost like it's a board game. Purpose is just this fun thing. We want purpose to look cute. We want to stand on a stage. We want to do what we're called to do just so we can get an Instagram reel. But the Lord wants us to know that he's more concerned with our being before he's concerned with our doing. We can't get so caught up in doing good deeds that we forget that we are who God says we are. And so in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. And so we get so caught up in thinking that if I just do this good thing, if I do this good thing, if I walk in purpose, then I'm doing. But it's better to be known by the Lord than to be known by this earth for doing what we think is a good thing. So if we think about when we meet somebody for the first time and we talk about our identity, if we introduce ourselves to someone, we begin to say things like we typically lead with what we do for work. And so we say, I'm this. This is who I am. And even right there, that tells us that we think our identity is correlated to how much money we make. What, how we introduce ourselves shows what we see as value. And so if we don't know the value that God has already assigned to us, we will try to give these long introductions, trying to impress people, trying to impress man. But we don't have to impress a holy and a righteous God, because what could we ever do to impress him anyways? And so if we're honest, we all say things like, oh, you know, I, I do this for work. Even our race, we take our race and we take our ethnicity so serious, especially as black people, because it has been so suppressed for so long. We take so much pride in being able to say, I'm a black man, I'm a black woman. But really, our blackness has nothing to do with our holiness. And so we have to be careful that we don't identify ourselves with things that we seem important that don't matter to the kingdom of God. And so we'll talk about it later. But even in the African-American community, if you're Greek, that is a part of your identity. That is part of your introduction. Wherever you go, whoever you know, you want them to know that I identify with this organization. And so if you're in these organizations, you can't leave home without a wristband on, without a little lanyard hanging out from your back pocket, hanging out of your purse. These organizations become your identity because you don't know your identity in Christ. And so we have to be careful, we even be mindful the way that we introduce ourselves, because the scripture also says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth flows. And so if these things are coming out of your mouth, if this is how you're identifying yourself, you've got to check your heart to see why does your heart identify as this? Why does your heart only see yourself to be a, a black man or a black woman or an entrepreneur or a creative or an artist, even a preacher? I can't get so caught up in my identity as a preacher that I lose my identity as a son. And so we have to be careful what we want to be associated with. We take things and we, we want to connect ourselves to things, these organizations, not just Greek life, but even churches. We have to be careful that we don't get so obsessed with being connected to things that will make us feel esteemed, illustrious, wise, exclusive, chosen. We get so caught up in wanting to be called those things, but if we really took time to get into the word, to get into the secret place, we would understand that these are things we already are in him. And so we have to be careful. We have to be mindful about what we identify of. Because when people see you, what, what do you want people to know about you? What do you want people to walk out of an interaction with you and saying about you? And so we have to be careful, again, about our identity in Christ. We get so wrapped up in who we are, how much money we make, where we live, what house we live in. And when we, we, when we see people, we want them to walk away with these things. But what if the, the children of light, in, this, in the NLT, this scripture from Ephesians 4 and 17, it's literally titled the children of light. And so what if, we began to, what if we began to be so concerned about our identity in Christ that when we met someone, we wanted them to know us as Christ, as the children of Christ. If we wanted them to know that I'm dressed in holiness, I'm dressed in righteousness, and I'm not ashamed of it. Because we live in a culture that makes you think that being righteous is corny, that thinking that holy is boring. It doesn't, I really don't care what anybody has to say because I know I've, I've had fun. And fun leads you to a lot of darkness. Fun leads you to a lot of late nights wondering how you're going to get home. Fun leads you to some jail cells. Fun leads you to places that God never intended us to be. And so what if instead of trying to dress ourselves in Greek letters, trying to dress ourselves in Louis Vuitton, trying to dress ourselves in red bottoms, what if we began to dress ourselves in righteousness, in kindness, in self-control? What if we began to dress ourselves in the word of God? What if we allowed his word to wash our minds, wash our minds with his words, not this trash of music that our, that our society is coming. We have music that is literally the enemy doesn't even have to do much work because the music that we listen to is doing it for him. And so we have to be careful that we don't get so concerned with I'm hip hop, I'm rap, I'm this. I'm not anything other than what God has said about me. 
if these things that we identify ourselves, if they can't go through the gates of heaven with us, we have to be concerned how attached we get to them. And there is a necessity, there is a, an urgency in the realm of the spirit for God's children to know who they are. The scripture says in Romans 18, and it's not about now, but it is about a time that is to come. And we know that we're walking towards that time. Romans 8 and 19 says that for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Do you know who you really are? When those sons of God are revealed, will you be able to say that I'm in the number? And so we have to be concerned about our identity. So I just want to touch on three main points tonight. We're going to talk about why is identity important? What is our God-given identity? And then how do we even step into this identity? And so why is identity important? Identity literally gets to the core of who somebody is. If you think about identity, identity is like the anchor that holds you down. And so when a storm of life shows up, what are you anchored by? Does your anchor have any weight? Is your anchor in the word of God? Is your anchor just on how many Instagram followers you have? What is your identity? Because there is a storm coming. You're either in a storm, coming out of one, or you're about to get ready to go into a storm. When the storm of life comes, when the enemy sends a storm to you, do you have an anchor that can hold you down in the storm? Because when depression comes knocking on my door, me saying I'm a black man does nothing for me. When something comes between your marriage, when something is coming for your child's identity, being able to say I have red bottoms, being able to say I'm a six-figure earner, being able to say I'm verified on Twitter, what does that do for you? That does nothing to a demon. That does nothing to a principality. That has nothing against a stronghold. The only thing that's going to be able to war for you in the time of warfare is the word of God. So your identity has to be grounded in the word of God. Where is your identity? What is the anchor that's holding you together? You have to know who you are. And this is the important thing. We have to know not just who we are, but who we are to him. That's the thing about identity. It's not just about who we are. Our identity is about who we are to him. Who are you to God? And that should be comforting that God cares so much about our identity that it's not just about us. It's about who we are to him. Our identity has already been given to us. Who are you to God? Do you not know who you are to God? Sometimes you just need to wake up. The scripture says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. The original, the scripture says that it really means that he established himself in the Lord. He was rooted in what the Lord had done for him and who the Lord was. And when you know who the Lord is, you know who you are to him. And so you have to be able to remind yourself who you are to the Lord. Just think about right now, who are you to God? Who are, who do you think you are to God? I was thinking about it today, and I, man, I was tearing my apartment up in tears because when you think about who you are to God, I'm the one that God came down for. I'm the one that he endured on the cross for. I'm the one that he left the 99 for. I'm the one that he stretched out on a cross for. I'm the one that he tore the veil for. I'm the one that he died for. I'm the one that he gave his precious Holy Ghost to. Do you know who you are to God? David said it like this in Psalm 8, 3 through 5. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And so you need to declare that over yourself. You are crowned with glory and honor from a holy God. What, what man can never affirm me, your affirmation from man means nothing to me. Don't tell me I'm handsome. Don't tell me you think I'm smart. Don't tell me you like me. It means nothing because of the affirmation that we have from God. Crowned with glory and honor. Made just a little lower than the angels. We are a sinful people, yet he made us a little lower than the angels because he loves us. We are the only thing that he created in his image. We are the only thing that he created and said it wasn't just good. He said we were very good. You have to know your identity in Christ. And so why is it important? Not just is it because it's our anchor, but we have an, we have an, if you don't know your identity, you need to know that the enemy knows it. And so we have an enemy who knows our identity and he's trying, he's constantly trying to attack us about it. He wants you to have a distorted image of who you really are so that you can never fully step into what you're called to do. Because if you're not fully embracing who you are, you cannot function in what you've been called to do. You cannot be a prophet if you don't know that you're a son. You cannot be a pastor if you are not secure in your identity in Christ. 
You cannot be a, a you, we don't even need to talk about the five offices. You can't be a disciple if you don't know that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to know who you are so that then you can step into what you've been called to do. And when you know who you are, you won't let people just call you anything. Don't let people just call you anything. Sometimes you got to say, I reject that. Don't let people speak words over your life kindly or not so kindly. Reject what people tell you if it's not lining up with the word of God. No, I'm not anxious. No, I'm not snotty. No, I'm not rude. I just know who I've been called to be. I know what my father says about me. And so if you don't agree with it, you don't have to agree with it, but you will respect it. You will receive. You don't even have to respect it, but you will receive it that I'm a son of the most high God. Don't let people talk to you crazy. We are Christians, not cowards. You don't have to lay down and take everything. If it's not in alignment with the word of God, it has to go. And so, again, we have an enemy who's trying to attack us. He wants us to be distorted in our identity. And he's, he's spending his whole existence attacking our identity. So if he's attacking our identity, it must be important. You should be on fire trying to figure out who you are in God. You should be relentless about trying to figure out what the Lord has said about you. What has the Lord written in the books of heaven about you? You need to know who you are. Because when you know who you are, you have a greater appreciation of who he is. The more you learn about God, the more you learn about yourself. It's a never-ending, back-and-forth, intimate relationship with God. And so because the depths of God are forever, we'll never know the fullness of God. Therefore, we'll really never understand the fullness of who we are because there's so much to us. But you need to spend your life trying to really figure out who you are, who you are in God. Because there's an, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's an inheritance to your identity. And so often we feel, so when we don't know who we are, we find ourselves settling for things. We find ourselves, and I'm not even just talking about relationships because so times we think about settling and it's only relationships, but we find ourselves settling for less than what God has said about us. We find ourselves settling for, you know what, I'll just deal with this anxiety. I'm just an anxious person. I'm just bipolar. I'm just this. I'm just that. I'm just rude. I just have a smart mouth. That's not what the Lord has said about you. So don't settle for things that God did not say. But if God didn't say it, don't settle for it. Because when we begin to settle for things that are not of God, then we find ourselves in habit. We find ourselves in cycles. Oh, I'm just a lustful person. I'm just a perverted person. I'm just a drinker. I'm just a smoker. I'm just a party. It's not what your father said about you. And so if we don't know our identity, we will easily find ourselves repeating cycles that the Lord so desperately wants you out of. And we find ourselves saying that I have a demon attacking me. I have a demon attacking me. Sometimes the demon has left. He said one thing to you about your identity. You accepted it. And now the stronghold has become so, so high and so lifted up. The demon is off to his next assignment because all he had to do was come for your identity. So we have to know who we are in Christ. And so often we find ourselves looking down upon people who don't know their identity. When we become to get a little bit awareness of who we are, we can find ourselves looking down on people who don't know who they are yet. We see people in cycles. We see people in situations. And so we have to know that it's not our place to talk down upon. If you know your identity, why don't you prophesy to your sister hers? We talk about people and their identity and this, this hypersexual society that we're living in that has become another identity where we want to be the baddest, we want to be the flyest, we want to be the hip. And then we find ourselves giving ourselves to people that we were never meant to give ourselves to. And when we see these people, we talk about them as if they have no morals, but it's not that they don't have morals, they just don't have an identity. And so they have no awareness of who, they're, who they are. But when you understand who you are and you understand the value of who you are, you just don't give yourself to anybody. Because when you understand the Bible says that we were blood bought, Jesus paid a price. When you understand the price that Jesus paid for you, you won't give yourself up so cheap. Understand who you are, that there is value a place, uh, there is value assigned to your name in heaven. When you understand the price, you don't, you don't give yourself to things so low. Jesus said, we're seated in high places. Why would I stoop down to be so low when I'm seated in heavenly places? And so we have to talk about our identity. We, this, we're living in a society where people want, we want to identify ourselves. I'm this, I'm they, I'm them. It's, and it's no need to bash. That is a real struggle. But we have to know that our sexual orientation is not our identity. Even what we desire sexually, that even doesn't have the right to claim our identity. 
And when we talk about sexual purity, let's talk to the men real quick, because so many times in church, we leave sexual purity as a, as a burden for our sisters. We, we want to down them. But brothers, we are seed carriers. That is part of our identities, that we are seed carriers. Our sisters are incubators. As men, we don't just go around giving our seed to anybody. If God has trusted you with seed to go into the earth for generations to come, why do we share it with just any and everybody? We have to be careful about our identity. We're not just men. We're not just women. We are seed carriers. Our sisters are incubators. When we give them seed, they incubate something to come into the earth and do the will of the Lord. But we have to be careful who we share that with. Our seed is precious to God, and it should be precious to us as well. And so let's get back to a wise identity important because it said you can't step into what you've been called to do until you know who you truly are. A person who settle in their sonship is dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. A son who really knows that he's a son, and I'm not just talking about men. Son relates to all of us. A, a son who really knows who they are is a dangerous person to the kingdom of darkness. And more than just sons and daughters, a church that knows who they are is dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And that's why there is an attack on the church. The enemy is coming for the identity of the church, and he's doing it with the weapon called compromise. He wants the church to be compromised. He wants the church to diminish the identity. that the, If the church was the bride of Jesus, why do we treat the church like it's just some game? The church is precious to God, and the identity of the church, the purpose of the church, is precious to God. And that's why the enemy is trying to distort how the church sees themselves, how the church desires to see themselves. We're living in a time where the enemy is trying to infiltrate the church and get the church to think, well, I can be the church and I can also be a drunk. I can be the church, but I can also be part of the world. I can do this and I can do that. I could be a Christian and be a homosexual. I could be a Christian and be an adulterer. I can be a Christian and be proudful because that's what everybody's doing on Instagram. I can be a Christian and still go have my turn up. Where, tell me what scripture says that. Tell me what scripture says it's okay for, for light and darkness to mix because it says the opposite. How can two walk together unless they agree? And all these things have crept into the minds of the believers. Deception. Deception is eating the believer alive. So if you don't know who you are, you are easily deceived. And that's how so many of us fell into these Greek organizations and any other gangs or whatever it is. We didn't know who we truly were. We were looking for identity and we found it in a place that was only ruining what God had placed inside of us. And when you give yourself to the enemy, he will take your identity and he will make you think that it's doing something, but he will take your identity. He will take your gifts and manipulate it and pervert it for the kingdom of darkness. When I was in Kappa, they wanted me to be a chaplain for Kappa. Now, how crazy is that for me to, to be a chaplain of an organization that's governed by a demonic entity? What sense does that make? But that's how the enemy will deceive us. He will take our gifts. He says, if you don't recognize your gift, I recognize it and I'm going to do everything I can to keep it in bondage. And so we have to know our identity. I just keep saying we have to know our identity. Psalm 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build labor in vain. And so when we're trying to build ourselves up, we're trying to build ourselves into these great men. We're trying to build ourselves into these women. We're building with the things of the world. Unless the Lord is building your identity, you're building in vain. So it doesn't matter how successful you are in the world, how, how many corporate ladders you climb, how many businesses you start. If you're building this identity yourself, you're building in vain. The scripture says in Hebrews that there's going to come a day where God shakes up the earth and every kingdom that's not of his is going to fall. He says that, that can be shaken will be shaken and that which can't be shaken shall remain. And so you're, if your identity is not built on the kingdom of God, it's going to be shaken and it's not going to remain you need to have something to stand on when it comes to this, to this thing called life. And so to make it in this world, especially, I'm sure every generation says that, but we are living in some crazy times. You have to know who you are. To live in a, a nation like this, to live in a state like this, to live in a city like Atlanta, you better know who you are. You better know who you are when you step outside your house in the city of Atlanta. Because if you don't know who you are, you can be easily twisted. You can be manipulated by the enemy. When you don't know that you are a child of light, you'll think it's okay to use your gifts for your own pleasures. 
That's how we see so many people manipulating. So many people have been giving the gift of speak, of speaking and preaching. They should be preaching and teaching, but the enemy has taken their gift of speaking and now they're manipulating and taking advantage of people. The scripture says in 1 Peter 4 and 10 that each of us, has, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so a part of our identity is that we are servants. I'm a bond servant for Christ. That's something that we should be proud to say. I'm a servant of God. Adonai means he is master. I belong to him. How many gifts that God has given us are being infiltrated and just twisted by the enemy? How many worship leaders that should be worship leaders are out here singing about their body parts? How many kingdom financiers are out here building biz, building pornography industries, building things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God? These gifts are being perverted, and God says, I want them back. There's something that needs to be done in the earth, and God is coming for his children to know their identity. And we have to know how to fight the enemy. We'll get to that later, but... Instagram quotes about our identity and living a successful life, living our best life, does nothing to a stronghold. And so you have to know who you are. And so what is our identity? So we know why identity is important. What is our identity? And so the most, base, the most basic form is that we are sons. We are children of light. That's what the scripture says. We belong to God. John 1 and 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And so children, sons, daughters, you have a right. It's not just a, it's a right to have the identity of a son. When you have a right, don't let anybody just violate your right. Stop letting the enemy violate your right as a son, as a daughter. Stop allowing him to, uh, to violate your inheritance as a son. There's an inheritance. The scripture says that we are co-heirs with Christ. So when you become, when you step into your sonship, you have an inheritance. A son always has a father. Now, in the natural realm, our fathers may not be present, but a son has a father. So as a son of God, you have a heavenly father, a provider, a protector, a deliverer, a strong tower, a strong hand. You have to know what comes. It's not just about knowing your identity. It's about knowing what comes with it and how to use it. Use your identity as a weapon of warfare. And so sometimes we don't take, we don't take the identity as a son or a daughter we don't let it hold much weight because it never meant much weight to us in the natural. So some people never experienced what it was like to be a son, to be a daughter. So when you tell them that you're a son or a daughter of God, it doesn't mean much to them. And this is why the enemy is always attacking families. He does not want us to be able to know the importance of a family because really the kingdom of God is a family. And so we have to understand how important the relationship between child and father is. Maybe your earthly parents couldn't take care of you, but God was always providing. He was always making a way. When you understand that you're a son, it will literally change your life. And when you understand what it means, you would never trade it for anything else. You would never trade your identity of being a son to be a son of darkness. When you really know what it means to be a son, to be a kingdom man, all that stuff means nothing. Nothing compares to being a son of God. A son has an inheritance, and a son is a co-heir. And so your first identity is a son. Now you have to know that a part of your identity is that you are chosen. You are not neglected. You are not rejected. You are not forgotten about. You are chosen. Romans 8, 15, and 17 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so you are chosen. God didn't just send you here and forget about you. He chose you. He didn't just chose you to do something. He chose you to be something and he chose you to be his. And so we have to be mindful of the fact that you are chosen. And even in the church, we have to be aware that just because you're single, you may not have been chosen as a bride or as a husband. You're still chosen by Christ. You have to know your identity in yourself and with God. And so the next part of your identity is that you are forgiven and that you are redeemed. Now, this is where the enemy is attacking so many of us and has so many people caught up because we live in shame. We live in condemnation. We sin so much. And so we think that our sin becomes who we are. But your identity is not shame. It's not condemnation. It's not the sin you did. Your identity is forgiven and redeemed. John 19 and 30, Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. 
it is finished is not just a catchphrase. It's not just a sermon title. It is finished means that Jesus paid the full debt for you to be forgiven. You have a right to call yourself forgiven. You have a right to forgiveness, and that forgiveness comes with our repentance. So forgiveness wasn't the only gift. Repentance was a gift to us as well. We have the ability, we have the privilege to come to God and to repent and receive forgiveness. And that's the enemy. He doesn't have that right. He doesn't have the chance to repent. We do. We have the chance to repent. And so you have to tell yourself, I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. Now, redeemed, that's always such a churchy word. What does redeemed really mean for us? Because you just can't tell yourself you're redeemed. If you, you need to know what redeemed means. Redeemed means for someone to actually buy back something to, to regain ownership. And so God bought you back with the blood of Jesus to say that I own you now. You are owned by God. Jesus came down to pay a price for you. He redeemed you. Matthew 27 tells us how the veil was torn. When Jesus was on the cross, the veil was torn. That means now we have access to God. There's no more barrier. We don't need a man. We don't need a high priest in the form of a man. When Jesus is now our high priest, your identity says, I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. You belong to God. You belong to God, and God is, not, God is not like us. When we own something, we may not take care of it. We may lose it. We may just let it hang on the floor. When God owns something, he takes care of it. He takes care of you. He's looking at you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the thoughts that you don't even want to think anymore. God owns you, and that's something to be proud of. We got to stop acting like being a Christian is something whack. Oh, you belong. I, I'm proud to say I belong to God. I'm proud to say I have a master. I'm proud to say I have somebody who rules over me because he's righteous. He's perfect. He's just. He knows what he's doing. Your identity is forgiven and redeemed. And so your identity is also righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we in him we may become the righteousness of God. And so when you receive the righteousness of God, you have right standing with God. You can approach. That's why Hebrew says, that's why the scripture says we can come boldly to the throne of grace. You don't have to, you don't have to approach the throne of grace whimpering. You don't have to be like a coward. You don't have to be afraid to say, master, can I even speak to you? You can go boldly to the throne of grace because you've received the righteousness of God. So when you go to prayer, pray boldly, pray with fervor, pray like God is going to hear you, pray like God is going to answer you, pray with an expectation because you know that you're righteous, not by your own doing, but because of God, because of Jesus. Receive your righteousness. Tell, it's, not, it's not prideful to say that you're righteous. You are righteous because of Jesus. Declare over yourself daily, I am the righteousness of God. Don't let your sin take away the fact that God has given you righteousness through Jesus Christ. You are not your sin. You are not your addiction. You are not your stronghold. You are not those thoughts that are in your mind. You are not what your mama may have said of you. You are not a bad sibling. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if you don't know anything else, use that as a weapon of warfare when you begin to question if you have a purpose. You are the righteousness of God. So your identity, you are also sanctified. 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 says that, and that is what some of you were. And so the scripture before was talking about how these certain sins are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so the scripture says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. This is doctrine. We need to teach doctrine. Yes, it's good to know your identity. Yes, doors are going to open, dimensions are going to shift and all this stuff. But do you know that you're sanctified? We need to teach sanctification, justification, glorification. Do you know that those things are a part of your identity? We can't know that they're a part of our identity if we're not even learning about them. And so when you became a son, when you became a daughter, Jesus washed you. He sanctified you. He set you apart. And when he didn't just set you apart for you to be forgotten, he set you apart for a special use. Sanctified means that you are no longer a part of this world. You don't belong to this world. You don't belong to the kingdom of darkness. And so when you're sanctified, that means you should walk a little different. You should talk a little different. It's okay for people to say, oh, you're a Christian. Yes, I'm glad to be a Christian. I'm sanctified. He washed me with his blood. He washed guilt off of me. He washed shame off of me. He washed disgusting desires off of me, and I'm sanctified, and I'm going to walk in it. We have to stop rejecting sanctification. 
we reject sanctification because we want to be so relevant. God didn't call us to be relevant. He said, you're righteous, not relevant. And when you're righteous, you don't need to, you don't need gimmicks. You don't need all this stuff. When you are righteous, when you're in right standing with God, he will do the work through you. We can't be out here sounding and acting like people that we're supposed to deliver. And so when somebody encounters you, they should feel the presence of God on you. They should feel the light. You should shift an atmosphere when you walk into a room. It's not just something cute to get the room hot. You should literally shift things when you walk into a room. If there's darkness, your light should begin to push it back. If there's anxiety, you should begin to bring peace into an atmosphere because you carry the, you, you carry the spirit of the living God. The spirit literally raised Jesus from the dead. So if he raised Jesus from the dead, it can change an atmosphere. You shouldn't be a victim at your workplace. You shouldn't be at your workplace feeling like you're secluded out. Well, you need to change that atmosphere. Begin to declare a thing in the atmosphere. Begin to speak the word of God. Begin to demand that the atmosphere come into agreement with what God has said about you. When people encounter us, they should know that there's something different about you. When it's something truly different about you, you don't have to post about it. You don't have to brag about it. Your true identity will speak for itself. Let your fruit speak for itself. You ain't always got to tell people you're sanctified. Let them experience it. And so our tongues also have to be sanctified. We just can't talk like anybody, like everybody, to anybody. Our tongues need to be sanctified as well. Our attitudes need to be sanctified. Yes, we really do have to live the scripture that says, turn the other cheek. That's what being sanctified means. I can't respond like the world. I don't get to cuss you out. I don't get to clap back at you all the time. We have to be sanctified. And so this last piece, I could talk all day about what our identity is, but this last piece is vital to where God wants to, to bring the people in this room, the sons and daughters. He wants you to know you are bold. Proverbs 28 and 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. If you are righteous, that means you have an innate ability to be bold. Boldness just does, doesn't mean you're loud. You can be quiet and be bold. Your silence can be bold. You don't always got to speak to be bold, but you are bold as a believer. So we come against fear and anxiety. We cast it down. Fear is not your portion. Anxiety is not your identity. You are bold. The right. If you are righteous, which we already established you are, you are as bold as a lion. That means you're not afraid to speak to anything. You're not afraid to speak to any worldly system, any worldly organization. If it's against the world of God, I will declare a thing. I will confront a thing. I will call out a thing because we are bold in God. We have to know that being bold is not a bad thing. Jesus was bold. Jesus spoke bold things. He didn't just let people run over him. He didn't just do anything. Jesus said what needed to be said in love, but Jesus said what needed to be said. Jesus confronted religious leaders. Be bold in Christ. Just because you're a Christian again, you don't have to be a coward. We are kind, but not cowards. We don't back down from the works of the enemy. If you see something going on that's not right, confront it in this realm of the spirit first. Seek instruction, but do not allow a thing to come and have dominion. Jesus said, we have dominion. Don't allow the enemy. He may have power, but he doesn't have authority. We have authority. That means our power is being backed up by something greater than us. You have authority, and be bold to use it. You know, when we were living in darkness, we had no problem being bold. We had no problem being out in the club two, three o'clock in the morning, posting that we were drinking and driving, smoking. Why is it that it's so easy to be bold for darkness? But when it's time to be bold for light, we want to sit down. Be bold for light. Be something that's going to stir some things up. Don't be afraid to rock the boat because Jesus is the God who get in that boat with you. And he will speak to the waves. He will speak to those winds. He will tell the contrary winds to cease. He will tell the waves, obey the voice of the Lord. So don't be afraid to rock the boat because my God is going to get in it with me. So when we know our identity, how do we step into it? So you can't step into something that you don't know. We love the scripture that my people perish for a lack of knowledge, but how many people do we see spiritually dead because they don't have knowledge of their identity? You have to dig into the word of God. The word of God, the scripture says that his word is spirit and life. That thing, the word of God should excite you. Uh, the Bible is not boring. That thing should make you, that it should be like fire shut up in your bones. Get to know the word of God. Proverbs 1 and 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if you want knowledge, if you want knowledge of your identity, you need to fear the Lord. You cannot know who you are in Christ if you do not fear the Lord. 
I saw somebody, it was Don Lemon said, the Lord is not to be feared. That, that is a lie. The Lord is to be feared. He is to be revered. He is to be respected. Our God, the living God, Adonai, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is to be feared. He is to be respected. He is to be obeyed. We have to fear the Lord enough to respect again that he is to be revered. And so you have to know, we also have to submit. Submission is a part of stepping into our identity. We don't get to choose who we are. We don't get to choose our identity. If God made you, and if we all agree, I don't think we made ourselves. If God made you, he has the right to identify you. Jeremiah 18, 5 and and 6 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so if you have been made by the Lord, the Lord gets to define you. You are his clay. He gets to mold you. He gets to put his hand on you. It may have to be some times where he puts a little bit of pressure on you. He may have to tear that thing all the way down to build it back up to be what it's supposed to be, to hold what it's supposed to hold, to have the endurance. But God has the right to identify us. And when you are his creation, when a potter is doing something, he has to put, when after he finishes shaping it, he has to put it in the fire for it to be really refined so that the shape can hold. And so this is why we have to endure a season of isolation and consecration. Just because you know who you are doesn't mean you have to go hopping on a platform than everybody else know. Get to know with yourself first. Get to know your identity between you and the Lord. Consecrate with you and the Lord. Allow him to ref- truly refine you. Allow him to truly put you through the fire so that you can see what's really inside of you. Because sometimes that fire needs to burn off some things before people experience the fullness of who God is calling you to be. Because just because you know your identity doesn't mean that you're fully ready to operate in it. There's still some things in your character that have to be refined. And so we're talking about consecration. And consecration isn't just logging off Instagram for the day. I need, we, we may have to, <laughs> you know, we, and, and consecration and fasting are two different things too, because with fasting is not logging off Twitter, fasting is not, fasting is turning down your plate. Consecration is when we just consecrate and we give our time to the Lord. And so there may be seasons where I don't, I don't have time to watch TV. I don't have time to be on Instagram. I don't have time to be in the group chat. I don't have time to be on the phone. I don't have time to be on FaceTime. It needs to be me, the Lord, in the secret place because I need him to know that I'm diligent and I'm eager to know who I am in him. God, I'm desperate to know who I am. I'm desperate to know what you called me here to do. I'm desperate to know the demons that you assigned me to slay. Dear Lord, I'm desperate to know what, why you sent me here. Why did you send me here? Because I could have stayed in heaven. So I need to know what you sent me here to do. And that takes time of consecrating between you and the Lord. Spend time in the secret place. And don't leave until God says it's time to go. Sometimes we rush our time in the secret place and we miss the thing that God wants to pour into us because we've done, I've done my 20 minutes, I've done my 30 minutes. Allow the Lord to soak you with his presence. Allow the Lord to drench you in his glory. Allow him to show you who you really are. Allow him to affirm you. Allow his voice to become louder than the voices that have been written in your head since childhood. Allow his voice to become so clear to you that you know when he's talking and when he's not. We spend, we spend years of our lives believing what people have said about us and we think five minutes in the prayer room is going to change us 35 years old and you've always thought you were anxious and you want to go spend five minutes in the word of God and then complain to God why nothing has changed we have to consecrate ourselves to the Lord how desperate are you for the thing that God promised you because your promises are attached to your identity so I want every promise that God has on my name I spent too much time being a fool so I'm going after every promise and that requires consecration that retires the secret place don't be afraid to con- you, ain't, you ain't missing out on anything if the Lord has set you aside you do, we bind the spirit of fear of missing out and you we lose intimacy with the Lord Do not be afraid of missing out on what's going on in the world. In Matthew 4, the story of the tempter, Jesus was literally consecrating himself for 40 days and 40 nights before he began and did miracles for people to see. Before he came out and began to confront things, Jesus consecrated himself to God. And so consecration, if we want to step into our identity, it's going to take a fear of the Lord. It's going to take knowledge. It's going to take submission. It's going to take consecration. And then sometimes, lastly, it may take a little bit of warfare. 
You see, sometimes we just want to wait on the Lord, but sometimes you don't get to wait for things. You have to war for things. I didn't just wait for peace. I had to war for it. Sometimes you have to be, not be afraid to war for what God has promised you. Contend for the promise. Contend for your identity. The scripture says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to pull down strongholds. Don't be afraid to step into the face of a stronghold because what can stand? If the Lord is fighting for you, what do you, this is why you need to know who your father is. His name is Jehovah. Gabor, the God who fights for us. He is the Lord God strong and he's a mighty God. Do you know you have a mighty God? What can come against a mighty, what stronghold can stand against a mighty God? What demon can come against a mighty God? You need to know that when you go into warfare, the God of God, the God of heaven's army is backing you up. You ain't got to be afraid to war. Don't be, don't be afraid of attacks in your dreams. Get up and begin to pray. Begin to pray in the spirit. Begin to pray the word of God. Begin to declare a thing. Begin to take your authority. God has given you authority. If he sent you somewhere, you have authority there. Never let the enemy punk you out of what God has said is yours. Don't be afraid to war. And this is why you need brothers and sisters that can war with you. Let the truth of who you are be a weapon of warfare. When the enemy comes to you with lies, you need to learn to reject what the enemy says. You're not forsaken. You're not abandoned. You're not trifling. You're not this. You're not that. You are only what God has said you are. He's called the accuser of the brethren for the reason. He's going to accuse you of being things that you're not. He's going to accuse you of having an identity that didn't come from Christ. And when he begins to accuse, you have to know how to fight back. You need to, you have a paraclete have a, an attorney in the spirit realm and you need to know how to access him and so we have to know our identity because the enemy wants the enemy is fighting for your identity you have to know who you are you have an assignment on your life and you can't step into it until you know who you are knowing your identity allows you to access parts of your father that you won't get to access if you don't know who you are you won't know that you have a provider if you don't know that you're a son that gets provided for you won't know that you're able to be comforted if you don't know that you have a comforter. Knowing your identity is going to change and save your life. And so we hear messages like this and we go to maybe conferences and we go to church services and you get all excited. You hear a good word. You're excited. But then when you leave, you instantly walk into warfare. You become weary. You become tired. And so the last thing I want to say is that your identity is going to require a press. You're going to have to press for your identity. You're going to have to press through the weariness. You're going to have to press through the warfare. The woman with the issue of the blood, or at least that's what we call her, she had to press because when she pressed her way to Jesus, Jesus said, he didn't say woman with the issue of blood. He said, daughter, you are healed. So after the press, when she pressed through the crowd, when she pressed through the negativity, when she pressed through disappointments, when she pressed through seasons of everything not working, her press allowed her identity to be restored. And so if you want your identity to be restored, you have to be willing to press. Press through. Press through. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to be the one who presses for you, but don't give up on finding out who you are in God. Don't settle for what this world wants to tell you is okay. Don't settle for what this world wants to tell you is a good person. What is it? Who is good but the Lord? Don't settle for finding out who you are in God. So I just want to end with some of these, some declarations for us to begin to practically put this into practice. So I'm going to say a thing, and if you just want to repeat it out loud with me, let's begin to step into our identity tonight. So I come out of agreement with rejection and yeah, I come out of agreement with rejection. I come out of agreement with rejection. And declare I am redeemed, adopted, and chosen by God. And declare I am redeemed, adopted, and chosen by God. I come out of agreement with shame of my sins and declare I am forgiven and justified by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I come out of agreement with shame of my sins. <laughs> And declare, I am forgiven and justified. And declare, I am forgiven and justified. I come out of agreement with fear. I come out of agreement with fear. And declare, I have power in God. And declare, I have power in God. I come out of agreement with condemnation. I come out of agreement with condemnation. And declare, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And declare, who the sun sets free is free indeed. I come out of agreement with loneliness. 
and declare I have brothers and sisters in God. And declare I have brothers and sisters in God. And I come out of agreement with darkness. And I come out of agreement with darkness. And declare I am a child of light. And declare I am a child of light. Amen. So let's just seal this in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for what you have done. Father, we thank you for what you have said, not just tonight, Lord, but what you have said before the foundations of time. Father, we thank you for choosing us. Father, we thank you that you love us enough to give us an identity. Father, we thank you that you chose us. We thank you that you didn't give up on us, Father. So tonight, Lord, we choose to agree with what you have said about us. Father, we choose to agree with the good things that you have said about us. Father, we agree with what you have said, Lord. You said that your word will not return until you void. So, Father, every good thing that you have said about us, everything good thing that you have said is going to happen to us father we agree that it is not returning to you void lord it is going to go forth and do not just accomplish father but your word shall prosper so father we declare that we are a prosperous generation because of what you have said father we declare that we are the head and not the tail we are we declare we are those who lend and not borrow father we are above and not beneath we are the righteousness of god in christ jesus we are a holy nation set apart a royal priesthood father we thank you for what you have said about us so father we pray that you would rid us of any anxiety any depression father we take authority over fear over depression over anxiety lord we loose the spirit of love and power and that of a sound mind we are those of a sound and a sober mind in the name of jesus father we thank you and we declare addiction is not our portion depression is not our portion suicidal is not our portion father we declare life and life more abundantly over your sons over your daughters father we declare they shall live and not die and declare the works of the lord father we take authority and father we thank you that you have given us the power to tread on the head of serpents and scorpions so father we thank you that we are victorious in you we are overcomers in you father we have joy the joy of the lord shall be our strength father we declare because we are your servants your word declares that no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper every tongue that rises up against us in judgment father it is condemned because we serve you father we are those who can declare that all things work together for our good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose so father be it unto us be it unto us your servant father we believe and we want to see a performance of those things promised to us because we believe in you so lord we thank you we love you father we declare peace joy and strength over this house father continue to move as only you can do through your servants who have submitted themselves to you Father, reveal yourself to your children and reveal themselves to you. Father, give us a hunger and a thirst for prayer. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word, oh God. Draw us into the secret place. Lock us in the secret place, Father, until we know who you are and who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.